This week on The Communicators, a discussion about the announced test market for the transition to digital television. We'll also talk about a new proposed venture which would offer a new nationwide wireless broadband service. Well, two big announcements this week in the telecommunications world. One deals with digital transition and the other deals with a clear wire Sprint Nextel venture. We're going to talk about both this week on The Communicators. First off, we want to talk about the digital transition. Joining us by phone is Bill Sappho. He is the mayor of Wilmington, North Carolina. And Wilmington, North Carolina has been chosen as the test market for digital transition. That's supposed to occur on September 8th of this year, while the rest of the country will get it in February of 2009. Mr. Sappho, Mayor Sappho, thank you for joining us on The Communicators. Why was Wilmington, North Carolina chosen as a test market? Well, for what we understand, <clears throat> we're talking with the chairman and our local broadcasters here, was that we were the smallest uh, television market uh, in, in the North Carolina area. We rank 135th in the nation. And 93% of our viewers already have some sort of digital um, tuners or digital TVs in place. So it gave the FCC um, some, you know, uh, they were comfortable with the fact that a vast majority of our market was already in place, which left only about 7% of our market that really needs to be converted over. It gives them the opportunity to take a look at different things that they're going to need to do nationwide to implement this, uh, this historic event. Obviously, one of the co uh, commissioners, I believe it was Commissioner Kopp, had made the recommendation uh, to the board that they should have a test market before they make this huge uh, transition nationwide, just so they can kind of look for the kinks and try to work out anything that uh, they may have not uh, thought about uh, before. And so it's, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity, uh, and it re represents a, a huge opportunity for the city of Wilmington to pave the way for the entire country. The FCC obviously has... Uh, has uh, communicated with us that they're going to come down here, they're going to put all the resources that they have into this process, working with the city and working with the surrounding counties that are going to be affected by this to make certain that this transition is done as smoothly as possible, as well as to learn from the transition and some of the pitfalls that may uh, transpire because of it. Uh, we all know that there will probably be people on the day that we make the switch that will go dark. And we just want to make certain that we get all of the information from the city's point of view and from the elected officials' point of view to all of our citizens as to what they may need to do, as well as get the FCC in front of all of the different organizations that out there um, that uh, could get out the message to everybody else. Obviously, uh, our local broadcasters are going to be very helpful and beneficial in this process. I think the local governments are going to play a huge role and disseminating a lot of the information uh, about what needs to be done. And also, I'm sure that from our point of view, that the vast majority of the citizens will be calling their local governments to get a lot of the information if they're not aware of it. So the FCC has also uh, assured me that they will have uh, some sort of an office open in each one of our counties uh, where a citizen can uh, make a call or we can direct calls to the FCC in respect to getting the conversion features uh, out to those people that need them. Uh, Mayor Sappho, is this something you lobbied for or was it a surprise to you? It was a surprise to me. I, I did not lobby for it. Uh, I was told about 48 hours before the announcement was made that the local broadcasters in our mo local market had voluntarily uh, gone into this uh, process with the FCC uh, and that the FCC um, pick this particular market for those particular reasons that I alluded to earlier. Um, you know, when they told me about it, of course, and they asked me if I would go to the announcement, I said, I would like to go. I think it's a historic moment in, in our, in our uh, country's history to make this, this, this switch. But I also wanted to be able to sit down with uh, Chairman Martin and other FCC officials and uh, ask them some questions about my concerns as the mayor of the city of Wilmington and make certain that they're going to put all of the resources that they have at their uh, availability, uh, you know, make sure that the, we have those resources uh, available to us. Mm -hmm. What you know, are some of, of your major concerns? 
Well, one of my major concerns is obviously, you know, you know Wilmington, North Carolina, it sits on the Carolina coast. Um, in the in the late '90s, we had about uh, uh, seven major hurricanes that came through our particular region. Uh, June will be the start of hurricane season. It doesn't end until sometime in November. Our concern, or my concern, as, as the mayor of the city, is that we do not want to make this transition in the in, in the event that there is a uh, threat of a of a hurricane, or if there's a tropical depression out there. Uh, the assurance that I was given by by Chairman Martin was that they would not make that switch if that was the event, if that was happening. The other part of it is that uh, our public television station, which is based out of Chapel Hill, UNC TV, is going to stay on an analog until the switch in February of '09, with the assurances that uh, we would have an analog station in place in the event that we do make the switch and then a hurricane does hit. So that was one of my main concerns. The other main concern that I have is obviously getting the information out to all of our uh, folks that uh, do not have uh, tuners or digital TVs. And they concern that there are enough converter boxes that will be shipped to this particular area to meet the demand of the folks that are going to be asking for those conversion boxes. Obviously, since the entire nation is going to be switching in the 09, and since we're going to be the test market, I wanted to have an assurance from the FCC that we would have an ample amount of those boxes in our market before everybody else, since we're going to be obviously uh, the, the, the test uh, the test cities and, uh, and did the test the, area. Did the FCC, Mayor Sappho, explain how they're going to uh, prioritize the boxes to Wilmington? Well, what they're going to do, they're going to have the, the, the people from um, uh, that, that, that have the conversion boxes, which they've already been in contact with our Circuit City and Best Buy, uh, you know, distributors of, of, of televisions in our particular area. They would also uh, set up, an, uh, as I said, an office in our particular area where people could come by and get the boxes. And it also would give us the opportunity as elected officials and as city governments and county governments that when citizens call us personally, that we can direct them to the different places where those boxes could be picked up, um, which I think is going to be, uh, you know, very beneficial to all of us. And Mayor, um, Mayor Sappho, have you heard from uh, citizens who are concerned about this? Oh, sure have. And what have they said? Uh, we've, already had, we've already had several calls, uh, and I know that uh, a lot of the broadcasters have already had calls on this. You know, obviously, a, a, a lot of people, you know, now that this thing is coming to the forefront and we're moving very fast with it, uh, have a lot of questions as to where can I get my, my converter box? Um, are you going to shut down the system in the middle of hurricane system? Um, you know, I've got two and three extra TVs at my house. Uh, which TVs uh, would I need converter boxes for and which TVs will I not need converter boxes for? Where can I go to get the converter boxes? Where can I get a coupon? Um and so those are the vast majority of the questions that we have fielded so far. Uh, my plan as the mayor of the city is to try to bring all of the elected officials into City Hall and bring the FCC here on the same day to be able to explain to all of the elected officials in our community and in our area uh, what this is going to mean, uh, what are they going to do to help you know, our surrounding areas in getting that information out to them, um, and being able to answer any questions that they're going to have uh, from those local elected officials in the surrounding area. Obviously, you know, the city of Wilmington is the largest city in the broadcast area, but we have a lot of small little cities that surround us, and we have a lot of counties, that, of course, that are surrounding us. Well, Mayor Sappho of uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, we look forward on the communicators to checking in with you as the date gets closer. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Well, we've also been joined by Cynthia Brumfeld. Emerging Media Dynamics, that's yes. her company, and she is the president. Uh, we invited you on to talk about the Clearwire Sprint Nextel venture that was announced also this week, but do you have any reaction to what Mir Safo was saying? Um, it sounds like they're doing the right preparation. Um, it, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about the hurricane season, but, you know, broadcast television is a, a primary way of communicating in the event of a natural disaster. So, you know, certainly I hadn't hadn't really occurred to me, but that's a very unique factor affecting Wilmington. Um, it's good that the FCC is doing this test market because it's, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense to sort of flip the switch nationally without having any real world experience. And that's my thought on it. Well, again, we invited you here to talk about the other major telecommunications announcement this week, and that's the Clearwire Sprint Nextel venture. Could you summarize exactly what that is? Yes, it's, um, uh, it's uh, Sprint, Nextel, Clearwire, a group of cable companies, Intel, and Google 
have all agreed, it's a fairly complex deal, I think it's a seven-party deal, have all agreed to form a separate company that will uh, sort of pursue the development of a new broadband mobile wireless technology called WiMAX. Um, the cable companies Google and Intel are collectively, I think, putting in $3.2 billion into the venture, which will be a separately uh, uh, constructed company called Clearwire. Uh, it will be controlled by Sprint, uh, and it, I think, is estimated to have a value of around $15 billion. So that, in a nutshell, is the transaction. It's fairly complex. It was a bit of a surprise. Uh, WiMAX has been kind of a dying technology, at least in the United States, and there was some sense that it was limping along toward perhaps its uh, obsolescence, but this kind of has revived this this once promising technology. So, you know, this is, you know, kind of the deal, is to jumpstart this new... Ms. Brumfield, why, why do you describe WiMAX as a potentially dying technology? Well, it's a very expensive technology. Sprint has tried, um, as has Intel, which is one of the biggest proponents of WiMAX, um, to get in the United States a WiMAX... Uh, uh, system constructed to build it. It's very expensive. It's very complicated. Um, it is something that will be going up against other broadband wireless technologies or so-called 4G technologies, such as, such as LTE, uh, which is a separate technology that the two primary uh, uh, mobile providers in the U.S., AT&T and Verizon Wireless, are pursuing. Um, it's very expensive. Imagine building a national communications infrastructure, which is really kind of what they're talking about here. Um, you know, they're saying uh, they can build it. They've only really got $3.2 billion in outside investment. Some estimates say it's going to cost maybe some multiple of that, $10 billion or $15 billion. That's a lot of money. And in, when you've got a competitive marketplace, such as the mobile or wireless marketplace, and you're going up against giants such as AT&T and Verizon, it's very difficult to mount. WiMAX has certainly... Uh, gained a toehold in other areas of the world, in Asia, where you don't have existing infrastructure, where you perhaps can charge prices that justify that kind of an investment. In the U.S., it's been very, very much a struggling proposition to get it built. Will it be a competitor with whom? It will be a competitor with uh, Verizon Wireless and AT&T. They're going to be introducing their own 4G services. Uh, and in some respects, since it's going to be a mobile broadband platform aimed at helping people have mobile, portable, uh, high-speed Internet access, for example, on laptops and, and handheld devices, it'll be a competitor to DSL and cable modem services. Uh, if you really find that this is all you need, you might be able to disconnect your DSL service or your cable modem service. So you know, it's certainly going to be entering a marketplace where it's going to be taking on a lot of different uh, uh, demands on the consumer's uh, communications expenditures. Why did Google invest in this? That's, well, that's the interesting part of it. Google has, over the course of the last 18 months or two years, been very keen on sort of spurring a new market for its uh, services, for its search engine services, for its video services, for its map mapping and location services, you know, the, the sort of standard PC and laptop stationary market has, has pretty much been tapped out. The next uh, sort of venture or the next field to enter would be mobile, and Google would like to have a, a say in how this, this whole new mobile field develops. They've developed uh, an open operating platform system called Android, specifically for mobile devices. They'd like to participate in seeing kind of this new broadband wireless world evolve. They'd like to have another outlet where they can sell advertising. Um, they certainly have been picked as the default uh, search engine provider for this whole new venture, as well as for Sprint separately. They, they cut a separate deal with Sprint uh, to sort of have Google uh, kind of be the default uh, search engine and, and mapping and uh, uh, video provider on some of the 3G handsets that are currently available. So. Google would like to see this market develop. It certainly is a prim primary way for them to generate new revenue, to spur new growth, uh, and it's uh, quite interesting that they're one of the participants. Intel? Intel has been the biggest WiMAX proponent from the get-go. They had a great success uh, with certain technologies. Certainly, you remember Intel Inside sort of propelled Intel to the top of the 
you know, semiconductor heap, and, and then their Centrino, their WiMAX technology, was a very big success for them. But again, that became quickly saturated, and where do you go from there? Well, there's this whole new field of mobile broadband wireless communications. Intel would very much like for it to be a WiMAX-based um, technology. They can brand it the way they did with Intel Inside and Intel Centrino. Uh, it certainly is something that is very central to their plans going forward. Is Sprint healthy financially? No, uh, and neither is, is Clearwire for that matter. And, and, and Clearwire was founded by? Craig McCaw, who is one of the pioneers in the, the sort of mo standard mobile wireless world. Uh, and he will also be the non-executive chairman of this new venture. Um, I have read uh, an article, uh, I guess, uh, yesterday that sort of likened the alliance of Sprint and Clearwire. Really, technically, what will happen is that Sprint will kind of contribute a lot of its wireless assets, its wireless assets to this new venture, which will be called Clearwire. And all of Clearwire's assets will be in this venture. And the two of them hope that in a combined fashion, they'll be stronger. They'll be able to lower costs. They'll be able to get... Uh, bulk discounts from technology suppliers. They'll be able to take advantage of, of each other's facilities, the towers, the poles that, that you need to construct this whole new network, and it will save money. But somebody wrote yesterday that it was sort of like watching two intoxicated people help prop each other up, you know, because they they both are in a very weakened condition. Um, Clearwire is very innovative, but it's losing, and it has lost a tremendous amount of money. Um, Sprint is one of the very few mobile carriers in the U.S. that's actually lost customers. They had a joint venture, uh, and there are some people that think this is deja vu all over again. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a cable consortium um, with a couple of additional cable companies that are not part of this pact uh, that formed an alliance with Sprint to launch uh, kind of co-branded mobile services for the cable industry, and it ultimately got off the ground in something called Pivot. It was a trial service where cable operators were selling mobile services, and it was a bust, and it really didn't work. Uh, and How much was invested in that? Oh, I can't remember at, the, at that point how but much. Was it a $12 billion uh, venture? No, it, was not quite as, it was not quite as large collectively as this venture. Um, and uh, it was probably, uh, I don't want, I can't remember off the top of my head, okay. but uh, it, was, it was in several billion dollars, and it just didn't, didn't really work. Uh, and so it's kind of back to the drawing board. And in this context, the cable operators will also be selling uh, sort of the, the, the service on, in a different configuration. They'll be selling it on a wholesale basis, and they'll have control of the customer, and it really will be kind of their service that they offer. Um, but I haven't heard any details as to how this will fare any better than the, the previous effort. Does does the fact that Google and Intel have supported this venture, does that add gravitas? Uh, well, I think Intel was certainly part of the earlier venture, too. Um, uh, it, it adds a, a wrinkle. Uh, I don't know about gravitas. Google certainly uh, is a very powerful company. It's a very powerful participant. It has been very persistent. In the wireless world, for example, there was just a recent... Uh, auction of a lot of spectrum um, called the 700 megahertz spectrum, very potent, powerful broadband spectrum that the federal government just engaged in. And Google um, was very successful in agitating for rules in that spectrum that it be open, that you don't have the kind of proprietary and, and relatively closed system that we currently have. Uh, and they were fairly impactful and fairly persistent, and they still are. They're still um, arguing that... Uh, the winner of this particular spectrum where there are these open access requirements, which is Verizon Wireless, you know, hold their feet to the fire, make sure they do what we think, you know, you ask them to do, which is you know, not behave in a closed kind of way. So Google is interesting, whether it's Gravitas, certainly I think they're not going to let this kind of drift away and not happen, uh, or they're going to do their best to make sure it doesn't drift away and not happen. Uh, does this uh, venture, Cynthia Brumfeld, make Verizon and AT&T step up their plans to release their WiMAX-type technology? Um, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen any specific reaction from, from Verizon or AT&T on this particular announcement. Um, what Sprint is saying is that they, one of the benefits they have, they're promising to get the service rolled out to 10 to, 
to markets where that have a t population of 10 million by the end of this year, and I think by the end of 2010 to markets that have a population of 120 to 140 million. Now that's still not nationwide, but it, it's a substantial um, kind of rollout plan uh, and a fairly expensive one too. That would put them ahead of Verizon Wireless and AT and T. Um, now, both of those companies have their own really interesting wireless developments going on. AT&T, for example, has the iPhone, which has been phenomenally successful. And, you know, that is a, a very big lure to consumers, even perhaps more so, you know, uh, at least at this point in time than being able to, you know, do broadband Internet access on your laptop. But, but can't you get uh, broadband Internet access on your iPhone? Right now, that's another interesting development. This, this is perhaps something that, that is a reaction by AT&T to what has happened with, with the Sprint Clearwire venture. Um, the rumor is, no, you can't. The answer but is you can't. can get the Internet. You can get the Internet. It's called 2.5G, it's, it's called 2 and it's an edge system. I actually have a Wi phone, and it's very um, weak in terms of technically being kind of an Internet access technology. But... The rumor is that they're going to be rolling out a 3G iPhone this summer. Um, AT&T supposedly sent out a notice to its employees that vacations are canceled, I think, at some point through July because they've got this big initiative underway and everyone's speculating that that will be the 3G iPhone that will be announced. And that will be a very potent device. That will be a very potent, uh, and the rumor also is the price will be reduced to $199, which is very affordable you know, compared to where they started out, which was $600. Um, you know, when you've got something, an iconic device that is very kind of drool-worthy, like the iPhone, and it has more broadband capable, it's not quite as fast as what the Sprint and Clearwire are promising, and it's not quite as fast as what's coming down the road for AT&T and, and Verizon Wireless, but it is you know, a leap ahead in terms of connectivity. So you know, those things are going on, um, and uh, it, it's really interesting to see, you know, what will happen and where consumers will gravitate to. Uh, if WiMAX, for example, if this venture is very successful in creating a very compelling product that everyone has to have at a price that's affordable, uh, that might overtake the market. That might become the de facto standard that everyone wants to have, and they'll beat AT&T and Verizon Wireless, you know, to, to that punch. It remains to be seen. Well, if this all becomes commercial, does this, does this affect municipal Wi-Fi plans or, or free Wi-Fi across the country in some way? Well, I mean, municipal Wi-Fi is cratering. It, you, know, uh, you may have read over the past couple of months that various you know, municipalities in Earthlink, for example, which is one of the biggest proponents of municipal Wi-Fi, are pulling out of it because it's not that desirable a technology for widespread deployment. It's very expensive. How do you justify the costs? The service speeds delivered really aren't that attractive when people can get 15 megabits uh, per second at home and you can only get, say, 1.5 megabit. And you, even then, for municipal Wi-Fi, and even then you have to pay $20 a month, and it's a mess. Cities are retreating. <clears throat> Earthlink is, is sort of has backed out. Um, Free Wi-Fi is, is quite different than what they're talking about. Free Wi-Fi is stationary. Um, it's important. Uh, Cablevision Systems, which is a major cable operator in the New York market, uh, announced yesterday that they're going to be giving free Wi-Fi service to, to their customers throughout the New York metro region, no matter where you are. So you can kind of take it, if you're a broadband customer, you can take it to, you know, from Long Island to Manhattan and kind of, you know, have free connectivity and don't have to worry about signing up or getting access. But it's not quite as dynamic. It's not mobile. You know, you really have to sort of be stationary near and near a Wi-Fi router in order to access it. But it is important and it is, you know, part of the mix that consumers expect. Uh, Cynthia Brumfeld, are there regulatory hurdles that uh, the Clearwire venture need to jump? Well, yes. I mean, they have to do a couple of things. They have to go through a, sort of an antitrust review, part of the Hart Scott Rodino process, and I think it's either the FTC or the DOJ will have to look at it for its antitrust elements. You know, is there something about this deal that will reduce competition? There, from what I understand, and you can never predict once 
economists and attorneys dig into a deal, you know, how they're going to come out. But from what I understand, there probably, you know, aren't any issues. That it, it won't, you know, kind of be turned down by the DOJ or the FTC, particularly with this administration. I mean, it just, I don't think they've really kind of turned down too many deals at this point. Um, Elections in November, any potential for change on that? You know, that, that that's an, they're, the parties involved say that they want this done by the end of the year. They want the deal closed. Now, if it slips into January or February, and presume if we have a new Democratic administration and, and you know, Democratic Congress, um, that could delay, certainly, the close of the deal. There, there might be, you know, a, kind of a closer scrutiny of it, and it certainly wouldn't be good. Um, uh, even then, though, I think that for a variety of reasons, I didn't, usually when these kinds of deals get announced, in my inbox I get emails from consumer groups and advocates, you know, decrying this element of it or that element of it. I did not get any with this particular deal. So I don't think anyone can immediately think what to object to about it. For one thing, there's a lot of skepticism as to whether or not it will really happen. And for another thing, as I mentioned, AT&T and uh, Verizon Wireless are so strong. They're very dominant um, mobile wireless providers in the U.S. And I think there are some folks who view this deal as maybe jump-starting competition to them. So it's a pro-competitive deal, um, you know, once you get into the analysis of it. Um, the cable operator element of it, you know, might be an interesting wrinkle um, because... As I said, you know, is this a comp competitor to cable modem service? You know, are you kind of maybe replacing, you know, one kind of competitive element with the, with another instead of adding, you know, a, a, another option? So, so that potentially could be thrown into the mix. But from what I understand, it really doesn't pose too many antitrust issues. Uh, then there's the FCC. They have to get FCC approval for the transfer of the licenses and. You know, again, who knows? I mean, if it happens before Kevin Martin, who's a Republican, um, uh, although uh, he's not a friend of the cable industry, uh, if it happens before he leaves as the chairman and we get a Democratic chairman at the commission, um, probably not as many issues as if, you know, once things change. So it, it's, it's, you know, the view, though, is that there really probably won't be too many impediments. Uh, what is Emerging Media Dynamics? What is your company? Uh, we do analysis of the whole media world with a particular focus on emerging media, on the new technologies, broadband-based video, uh, audio, uh, uh, voice services that are, are being developed. We do consulting with major media companies. We do conferences and reports. Um, I also have a blog called IP Democracy that focuses on some of the public policy issues uh, and how they intersect with some of these things that are, you know, emerging from Silicon Valley and uh, technology convergence and everything else. Do you have a dog in this fight at all that we've been discussing? No, no, no conflicts, no investments, just an observer. Cynthia Brumfeld, president of Emerging Media Dynamics, thank you for being on The Communicators. Thank you, Peter.